but for Rosemary Rutherford, has proved exceptionally interesting to the degree that the fundraising is almost secondary, a bit of a sideline. It is not, of course, um, and I do draw your attention to the ubiquitous raffle, um, which Sheila is selling tickets for, and the refreshments that will be available after the talk, which we hope you'll stay for and give us more donation. We're delighted with the amount of work that has taken place for each of the talks, and this has been captured for posterity in the publication. And the most recent is now available, The Life and Works of Rosemary Rutherford, which was completed in time of the opening of the wonderful exhibition, which I trust you will explore after the, the, the talk this afternoon, if you have not already done so. A lot of research was undertaken to inform both the exhibition and the publication, and we will be continuing to present some of this in subsequent talks later in the year, so do look out for the posters. However, this afternoon's talk and the following two, to be held in June and July, have been arranged with regard to St Mary's undertaking to become an eco-church. So we're focusing on issues relating to our churchyard and its rich diversity of flora and fauna. Please do continue to support these talks. The plan for this afternoon is for Roger to give us a talk about the trees in our beautiful churchyard, and then, for those of you who wish to, we encourage an exploration of the site. We've been blessed with a glorious afternoon, so it's a great opportunity, and Ross has created this I Spy, which you could follow as a guide, and there are all the trees that Roger will be talking about. You could go and have a hunt for them in your, at your leisure, and they come back for refreshments to recuperate. <coughs> Sustenance will be served in the hall for those that don't want to go out and explore and of course to refresh those that have. Before we start though, just a few housekeeping issues. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this place, um, there is an exit here and of course the exit was the entrance that we came in. It's unlikely to be any place. Cloak rooms are situated just at the end of the corridor as you go out of the door one either side. Um, if anyone feels unwell, please don't hesitate to contact both Cathy and myself for our first favours. And please ensure your mobile phones are busy, switched off or turned silent. If anyone is unable to hear our speaker, because we haven't got mics set up, because we don't need them, Roger has a wonderfully powerful voice. <laughs> much more powerful. <laughs> but please, it is up to you to just raise a hand to indicate that we need to up the desk level a little bit. Of course, we will respond. So with no more delay, it's a great pleasure that I can introduce our speaker this afternoon, who is probably known to most of you. I've long found it really sad that I learn the most fascinating features of someone's life when I'm paying my last respects to them. So when I asked Roger to tell me a brief bio to enable me to introduce him this afternoon, it was with great surprise and pleasure that I learned many totally unsuspected features of his career in an area that I had never linked with him. I somehow thought he was a city gentleman. So, as it summarises a rather interesting livelihood, I'm going to read the whole thing he sent me. That's really fascinating. Roger well, probably doesn't need much introduction. He's been a church member here since moving to Brookville in 1969 and was one of the bell ringers team for many years. I'm also known for his involvement with the Scouts for over 50 years and in all conservation related natural matters. After studying plant pathology at the University of Bristol, Roger started his working career in the 1960s with May and Faker as a field trials officer at the Agricultural Research Station in Ongar, first developing new projects to replace DDT to combat Dutch elm disease. He then became the company's tree specialist, working on pests and diseases of crops around the world, from apples and pears in Europe, to coffee and cocoa in Africa, and from bananas and citrus in the Caribbean, to mangoes and rubber in India, and to pineapples and exotic fruits like durian in Thailand. Are they as bad spelling as they said to me? They certainly are. <laughs> 
In fact, when his son Simon was asked at Bakewell what job his daddy did, he replied, my dad watches apples grow on trees. <laughs> <laughs> Roger continued to travel the world for the next 30 years, working in research and development, and then became park operations manager at Lee Valley Recreational Regional Park, heading up the park ranger service and managing the park's 10,000 acres of recreational land in London, Essex, and Hertfordshire. He also became heavily involved and supporting park rangers in Africa and India, combating poachers, and continues helping to provide for the families of park rangers killed in the line of duty. He is currently the Vice President of the International Rangers Federation. So without more ado, I hand over to Roger, who is going to introduce us to some of the trees in our beautiful churchyard. Thank, Thank you, Roger. Thanks very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this particular picture we've got up here is one that you're probably very familiar with. That if we approach our church from Main Road, um, it becomes fairly obvious straight away that, that the area, and the church in particular, is uh, dominated by, by trees. And too early man, uh, trees were objects of awe and wonder, mystery of their growth, the movement of their leaves and branches, the way they seemed to die and come again to life in the spring, and the sudden growth of the plant from the seed. All these appeared to be miracles of nature. So my presentation is uh, going to be in two parts. As I said, we're going to have a, a, a chat here, and then for those who'd like to go out and have a look at some of the trees outside. So, uh, there we go, yes. Um, there's a saying, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm a scout leader, and, and a lot of scouting is based on Rudyard Kipling, and Kipling has a very famous, I keep six honest serving men, they taught me all I knew. Their names were what and why and when, and how and where and who. So, we're going to hear a little bit, I hope, about what trees are planted, where they're located, how to recognize them, when they were planted, and who were some of the people involved in that. So we're going to start the, uh, the virtual tour if we arrive in the car park. So you arrive in the car park and immediately you see this great line of lime trees along the, uh, uh, along the west wall. And limes, limes are in fact one of the, uh, the tallest walking trees yeah, in, in Britain and they can live for 500 years or more. And these limes that we have here are, are certainly over a hundred years old. Uh, you may have seen that in the top of them, uh, we're seeing a lot of mistletoe. And there's more mistletoe around these days. Um, and generally thought that perhaps the reason is down to global warming, particularly black caps. Now black caps love mistletoe berries, but black caps used to migrate during our winter. Global warming means they're hanging around now, and their snack of uh, mistletoe yeah. berries. They wipe their beaks on the uh, on the trees, giving rise to uh, uh, to the, the, the great mistletoe that you see here. But if you ever parked under uh, a lime tree, then uh, you'll be aware that limes are also loved uh, by aphids, which. Uh, drip their sticky honeydew uh, onto anything that's underneath the tree. Uh, but when you get aphids, you get hoverflies, uh, um, you get ladybirds, you get ants, uh, and the birds then come in, and so you get many species of birds as well. So limes, pretty good for wildlife, not so good for cars. <laughs> so I said that this was uh, a line of, um, of lime trees, but um, not quite true if you have a look at them, because the third one from the end, as you go up towards the gate that comes in from the car park, is a beech tree. Um, it's uh, a copper beech. Uh, it's actually a glorious leaf now starting to come out. I actually took these a little bit earlier. Um, a beech is, is you know, another tall tree, puts in a big canopy, 
normally you get a lot of it in, in, in woodland. And um, uh, in, in beech woodlands, uh, uh, because the beech is, is quite a, a pliable wood, it, it, uh, it bends easily, you get um, bodgers setting up. They put their, their primitive um, pole legs and uh, turn chair legs. Um, then the, uh, the other thing that beech wood can be used for is dowsing. Um, I mean, some people use hazel, but you can use, usually use anything for dowsing, but, uh, but beech is something that um, uh, dowsers use as, uh, as well. And the beech, those of you who've got beech hedges or will know that beech tend to hang on to their leaves during, during winter. Uh, and I'm not going to go into a lot of technical detail, but there are one or two. That's called marcescence, hanging on to the, to the leaves uh, um, during, the, uh, uh, during the winter. And, and beech has a very smooth bark, so um, again, it uh, tends to um, enable a variety of mosses and lichens and things to grow on the surface of the beach. It's considered to be, I mean, when the oak is the king, uh, the beach tends to be called the Queen of Trees. And like a lot of things, it's used for medicinal properties. Um, it's said that uh, um, beach leaves can be used to make uh, a poultice to reduce swelling and things. And there are lots of things, you know, stuff your mattress full of beach leaves, and uh, that's going to speed up any healing process that, uh, that you do. So that's along that western wall that I said. And if we move, from that, so that's over here behind us as you come from the car park. You move down to the wall to the corner, uh, and there's a really interesting tree there. Those of you who, uh, a bit like me, have been around for some time might remember there was an enormous horse chestnut tree in the corner which, uh, which had to be felled. But um, what we have now, I'm oh, sorry, a little bit about the, uh, the beech tree, it tended to be, uh, um, it's called Fargus. The, uh, the god of the beech tree, and of course those who know anything about botanics, Fargus is also the Latin name for, uh, for the beech. Uh, so moving down onto that corner, we've got this really interesting little tree, only a little thing at the moment, but notice just now, it's coming into leaf nicely, and this is a living fossil. This is the ginkgo. And, uh, this was the sole survivor, in fact, today of, uh, uh, of trees that, uh, a family of trees that existed 250 million years ago. Um, and it was long thought to be, uh, to be lost, but um, uh, it can grow for a thousand years. Uh, Paris is a little fellow at the moment, but uh, there's one in China that's written to be 3,000 years old. Um, and like a lot of things, Ginkgo and a lot of things in China as well. Animal, vegetable, and mineral, everything seems to be used in China for medicinal purposes. And ginkgo is obviously used uh, um, for treating various things. Uh, these days it's, it's more like a, a brain food, if you like, um, but uh, it has been used for all sorts of uh, different things in the past. Uh, ginkgo in China produces nuts, and the nuts have been used for cough medicines and uh, uh, fevers and diarrhea, you, you mentioned it, ginkgo tends to be used for it. So, from that corner, um, turning around and looking towards the church, uh, we've got our lovely magnolia tucked in there behind the, uh, behind the porch and the, and the wall. And uh, where it's located does seem to give it a bit of protection. I mean, the You'll know that the flowers can be very susceptible both to frost and to uh, and to rain. Um, and uh, tucked in there behind the church, uh, it, it was gorgeous in flower earlier uh, earlier in the month. Um, this was uh, a particular species. Of, there's many many subspecies of Magnoliaceae, um, but the original uh, plant was. Uh, uh, from which everything else derived um, was found in Martinique, which was uh, um, a French, or it still is, a, a, a French overseas territory. And uh, it was brought back to Europe by uh, a Monsieur Magnol, 
from which magnolia is named, or corsage in Angola, <coughs> but uh, this year Magnol from Angola, uh, who was the uh, um, botanist at uh, Montpellier, he brought this one back, and uh, magnolia now that we, we have today is, uh, tends to all come from that species he found originally in, um, in Martinique. Uh, has got really many uses in terms of um, its timber. Uh, some people have pickled the, uh, the flower petals and the flower buds for, for some of the flavouring. Um, but um, it has been, if you travel to the USA at all, in the southern states, it's, uh, it's used very much as a, as a street tree in, uh, in the southern USA. So, from the magnolia, we've just got to turn around and we see our magnificent cedar of Lebanon. Now, we've got four cedar species in the churchyard. So, cedar of Lebanon, uh, biblical and mythological um, connections. It's mentioned several times in the Bible. Uh, Hebrew priests were uh, told by Moses to use the bark of the Lebanon cedar in the treatment of leprosy. Um, the uh, Solomon built his temple at Jerusalem from uh, the massive cedars of Lebanon. <laughs> and uh, prophet Isaiah refers to the cedars of Lebanon with the oaks of Bashan as examples of, of loftiness. Uh, and in Psalm 92, uh, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, she shall grow like the cedar of Lebanon. And you get cedar of Lebanon quite a bit in uh, churchyards, uh, thought to represent sort of purification, uh, uh, protection against sort of incorruptibility um, and eternal life. So, as I say, the strength of the timber is such that it's used in, in lots of buildings. Um, and the oils of the cedar um, are used to make uh, cough medicines and uh, antiseptic. And the Egyptians used to uh, bring the oils from the cedar of Lebanon back to Egypt for embalming, embalming the dead. So what about our cedar of Lebanon? Well, when was it planted, I think, is the first thing that we want to try and tackle. And Neil's excellent book, which I used for a little bit of research, um, worked out, I think, that it was planted in, uh, well, we'll come on to when, perhaps in a minute, planted by John Whiting, so you're familiar with our list of uh, uh, vicars on the wall, and John Whiting is uh, 1861-1876. So, why might he have planted it? Because it was John Whiting who, in the mid-1860s, spearheaded the rebuild of the church. Um, you'll perhaps be familiar with this uh, picture here. This was during the, the, the rebuild. As I say, it started about 1868. Um, and the front of the church up to work where the cedar is. Probably wasn't there at that time because it was effectively uh, uh, a builder's yard. So why do we think that uh, it might be John Whiting? Well, the rebuild of the church was eight, finished in 1871. And you can see in this picture, now this picture in Neil's book is said to have been taken um, in the late 1870s, so certainly before 1883, the reason being that in 1883 the lich gate was built, and so there's no lich gate here at the moment, and here is the tree, and what better way at the end of the rebuild in 1871 to say, great, the builder's yard's gone, the church is open again, let's plant a tree. And so I'm reckoning that they planted that tree in about 1871, 
probably three or four years old at the time they planted it. Um, it's growing here, and we'll be also talking about ewes in a minute, and just on the corner of the church. I reckon that's the ewe tree, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So on that time, planted in um, 1871, probably five years old when it was planted, I'm reckoning that that cedar tree's about 150 to 160 years old. But there is a way of calculating it. One of the ways of calculating the growth of the tree is to measure the circumference of the tree uh, at between a meter and about 1.3 meters. Um, and we've got some kit out there, but if you'd like to go and have a go at it, when we do our little walkabout, you'll see, be able to see whether or not that 150 to 160 years old uh, is about right. So, as I say, turning uh, around, uh, oh, this is the growth of it in about 1910, so coming along and even a bit further along in the 1930s. So, turn around from the cedar tree, and on the corner, we've got the yew. And there are um, two yew species we have in the churchyard. Uh, English yew, which is more of a sort of a spreading habit, and Irish yew, which is more of a, a column. So up by the war graves, uh, that one there is, is the Irish yew. Why does every churchyard seem to have a yew tree? Um, I'm from Gloucestershire. Uh, there's a uh, one of our churches in Gloucestershire, St. Mary's in Painswick, it's got 99 yew trees. They keep thinking, well, why haven't we got a, you know, 100? They tried to plant one during the millennium. They planted it. Two years later, one of their existing yew trees blew over. And it was said to be a connector that the devil didn't want them to plant. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so we have English U and we have Irish U. Um, and it's no wonder that Lord Voldemort, I was saying, Tom Riddle as he was then, when he bought his, uh, when he bought his wand at Ollivander's, uh, had a wand of U with a, uh, a phoenix feather core. Um, because U is the symbol of life and death. Uh, and also resurrection and longevity. But, um, and that was based on the fact that the tree does have this habit of regenerating and, and growing for many, many years. Um, but there are, and I can suggest that there are perhaps four other reasons why yew trees are planted in churchyards. Firstly, the Druids. Now, the Druids, um, they often had their places of gathering. They worshipped outside, and their places of gathering and their ceremonies were often under um, yew trees. The second possibility is cadavers, dead bodies. Um, one folk belief is that uh, yew trees thrived especially on, uh, on ground where there were bodies, decaying corpses. Um, in 1644, there was a guy called Robert Turner. He wrote a book, The Panologica, uh, and uh, he said that the yew trees uh, helped uh, absorb the putrefaction and the vapors coming from the dead bodies and kept the air clean. The third reason for yew trees in churchyards is the longbow. Uh, your history may remind you that. Uh, during the Hundred Years' War, in the Battle of Cressy, the Battle of Poitiers, the Battle of Agincourt, the longbow uh, was supreme. And therefore, the suggestion was that it was obligatory for churches to plant yew trees in order to provide a source for longbows into the future. Um, I think this is probably fake news. I mean, they, they probably did use some, but the best U for making longbows was an English U. It was U from Europe, where it could grow, it was much tighter grained, uh, slower growing, and uh, therefore provided a, a, a very much uh, better stain for um, 
totally in the wrong boats. Um, but undoubtedly, you know, I mean, people were worried about getting the source. I mean, Henry VIII <coughs> sent out agents over the whole of Europe to try and secure long bones, uh, to Austria, to Poland, and to Italy, to Spain. Um, so they continued, obviously, to, to source them. And at that time, if you were importing wine into, the, uh, into Britain from Europe, they levied a tax on the wine that came in. And the tax was use names, not money, use names. Some of you might uh, remember the Mary Rose. <coughs> and the Mary Rose uh, was uh, sank in 1545 uh, and was raised in, or the remains of it were raised in 1982. Uh, and in the, uh, in the raising of that, they discovered 137 new stains from the Mary Rose. And they did a lot of research on that and uh, they were all made in Italy, or they all came from Italy. They were enormous things, they were over two meters high, you know, so pulling the longbow uh, needed a fair amount of strength. But by the time uh, of Queen Elizabeth I, it was written that there was no tradable new wood left anywhere in Europe, and that that actually um, speeded up the uh, development of uh, the musket as the weapon rather than the longbow. Although the last, I think the last um, battle where a longbow was used was in uh, uh, the British the English Civil War in, uh, in, in uh, 1644. So uh, anyway, that was another reason for using church eyes. And the other one is protection against grazing animals. Now, you is poisonous. All parts of the you, apart from the fleshy, uh, the red fleshy bit of the berry, all the rest of it is poisonous. And therefore, it was felt that uh, if you had yew trees in the churchyard, uh, that would um, prevent the local people turning out their animals to come and graze uh, in the churchyard. Um, as I say, the yew is poisonous, and uh, um, so much so that uh, the yew leaves produce uh, taxidermy, which is used as a, um, a cancer treatment. Um, and uh, when I was the park manager at Lee Valley Park, we had an enormous yew hedge in the park hedge quarters. And every year, when that was split, we sold all the, uh, the arisings to a pharmaceutical company who had extracted the, uh, the taxidermy from it to, to turn into. Uh, turn into two cancer drugs. There was one final thing about the yew tree that it was felt that uh, the, the fronds of the yew could be substituted as, uh, as, as palms for wavering and palm sunday, the only growing palm trees over here. So, uh, from that yew tree, move over to um, the corner by the little metal gate as you come up the, uh, the churchyard path. Right in the corner, there is a liquid amber. Now, the liquid amber, um, it's, I thought it was dead. I went up and looked at it the other day, and I thought, yeah, this is dead. But in fact, if you look carefully now, you can see it's, just, it's starting to shoot up in the, uh, in the pots. I've got a feeling that the bottom is not quite right, but uh, it's still alive. And um, liquid amber um, was uh, one of the trees that, um, when Philip of Spain was looking to their new territory that they'd acquired through Mexico. Uh, he sent a, a botanist there, Hernandez, to see what their uh, what the resources in Mexico were, and he came back and said that uh, there was this tree that produced a, a sweet gum, which uh, he called liquid amber. Liquid amber, as one word, is what the tree is called here. He called it back in uh, the time that he went to Mexico in the 16th century, liquid amber. Um, and it produces this sort of sticky gum. But right next to uh, that, as we walk up the path, um, we've got the Western Red Cedar. There's a number of Western Red Cedars in the churchyard. This one's particularly sort of dominant. Um, 
it's the second cedar species, as I said, of the four that we've got in the churchyard. Uh, highly regarded by uh, certain um, um, peoples in uh, North America, the North American Indians, particularly on the west coast of North America, highly revere the, uh, uh, the, the red cedar. Uh, they reckon that if you stood against the back of the red cedar, it would give you strength. Um, and uh, of course, red cedar shingles, which uh, you'll remember we have on the church. Um, uh, so, um, commonly used for making uh, for making shingles. Uh, you know, when it's fresh and uh, you know it's got that really warm, uh, the warm appearance, uh, and the. Indigenous peoples up that western side of North America, particularly up through British Columbia, uh, they uh, use it for totems. They built their early canoes from red cedar because, again, it's got uh, oils and things in it that make it particularly good for uh, uh, building uh, building canoes and the like. And they uh, they use the the fiber of the bark as well for making uh, uh, they sort of string it and make hats and baskets and all sorts of things with it. But again, because of the oil in it, uh, making hats, it's protection against the rain. So very, you know, a culturally important uh, tree, the, the Western Red Cedar. And a little bit further up, on the, against the wall, we've got the tree, the memory of Nora Foster from her friends in Mother Junior. What I just wanted to say at this point is that um, there are a number of trees in the churchyard that have been planted, you know, in memory of people, uh, in memory of, of different events, um, and all of these trees are obviously significant to those who planted them, they've been planted for certain reasons, uh, and so I'm not really going to go into detail about the, the memorial trees, uh, because I'm not really privy to, to, to why they were planted. Um, but suffice it to say, they're mainly ornamental species, uh, and they've probably all been planted within the next, the, the last uh, 20 years or so. One or two exceptions, but generally that. But uh, this particular one, to Nora Foster, is a Rabinia, uh, or also called the Black Locust. Um, and uh, there's a suggestion, I mean, this goes. You know, the original species were uh, discovered in, um, in Virginia by British colonists back in the um, 17th century. Uh, and the Jesuit missionaries at that time um, tended to think that the black locust was the food that was referred to uh, in the Bible that supported John the Baptist when he, uh, uh, when he wore camel's hair and ate uh, locusts and honey. Uh, but as it's a North American tree, uh, it's probably not true, um, but uh, John's food was possibly, because again, it's a Mediterranean tree, uh, is the locust bean. Uh, there's a carob tree that produces long, um, like long pea-shaped uh, um, pods, and, and that could well be the locust that was being referred to as far as John the Baptist is but uh, again, the French uh, brought, uh, brought this back to Europe. Uh, Jean Robin uh, was the guy involved there, and hence Robinia, named after him. But uh, whereas uh, here they seem to behave themselves, I mean, it's a, a leguminous tree, um, a little bit like uh, um, you know, peas and, uh, and that sort of thing. So it, it has uh, modules, root modules, that enable it to. Uh, Fix nitrogen, but as I say, in Europe it tends to be okay, to, but in North America it's rampant, it grows everywhere, it just throws up suckers, and uh, uh, it's, it's what they call an alien species, so uh, they don't like it. But next to the Robinia, uh, right on the corner of the uh, uh, here, um, is the Tree of Heaven, this one here. Um, and why is it called the Tree of Heaven? Um, possibly because, again, this one tends to come from the uh, 
from the East Indies, and there it is revered as a tree that stretches up to paradise. So that's possibly why it's called the uh, tree of heaven. Um, again, the Chinese tend to use it for uh, uh, medicines, uh, but it's also a host of the Ianthus silk moth. Whereas the normal silk moths feed on, the caterpillars feed on mulberry, these caterpillars feed on the uh, Alianthus or the tree of heaven. Um, tends to produce a silk which is a lot stronger than uh, uh, the mulberry, but again, it doesn't spin as well. Um, uh, <laughs> it's uh, referred to as uh, peace silk, P E A C E. Peace in this sense being the fact that to produce silk from the mulberry, the larvae that have spun their cocoons are all boiled in boiling water and killed, and then the, the silk is spun. In Alianthus, they wait for the moth to emerge from the cocoon, and then they process the fibre from the, uh, the cocoon. So it's called the peace, uh, the peace silk that comes from um, from the tree of heaven. But again, like the Robinia that we've just been talking about, uh, in North America, again, it's a suckering tree, produces suckers, and we call it the tree of heaven. America is called the tree of hell, because <laughs> it just grows everywhere. It's a bit like Buggy, you know, there's all the railway tracks, and uh, they hate it. But, we talked about being called the tree of heaven, and very close to it, we do have a tree that almost stretches up to heaven, and this is our wonderful Wellingtonia. Um, now, uh, there was a guy called William Lobb, and we're going back now to um, sort of the mid-1800s. Mid so about 1850, he hopped a ship over to uh, North America and heard about these magnificent trees growing on the west side of uh, the, U uh, the US, went in, found them, samples of seeds, seedlings, and hopped your ship again to come back to Europe and bring these wonderful trees from the uh, Sierra Nevadas and to uh, start multiplying them and um, they soon started appearing in British estates <coughs> and this sort of thing. But there was a bit of controversy about this because Lobb um, decided that he would register the name of the tree as a Wellingtonia, because Duke Wellington had recently died, uh, and um, he had brought back the specimens that were required by, uh, um, you know, the Horticultural Society in, in, in Britain to register the name. So he registered it as Wellingtonia. The Americans hadn't actually got as far as registering what they wanted to call it, they wanted to call it the Washingtonia. So there was this sort of aggro between Wellingtonia and Washingtonia, and eventually uh, the name was decided upon uh, a number of years later. Um, they settled on the name of uh, uh, Sequoia Dendron Gigantia, or what we now call the giant uh, the Sequoia. You know. and, um, but we still call it the Wellingtonians. Um, our kids, when they were young, they called it the punching tree because the bark of the Wellingtonia uh, is really soft and spongy. So you can actually go up to it. You can hang your fist as hard as you like on that tree. It just won't hurt at all because it's just like a sponge. Uh, right, moving on. Um, our Wellingtonia, how old? Uh, over a hundred years. Not as old as the Cedar of Lenin. Say. But they can live, obviously, for a long time, and uh, um, and the height. I mean, sun in the west of the USA have been found to grow, you know, three hundred feet or so, and uh, and they do have a very long, um, you know, a long lifespan. So ours is a relative youngster at a hundred. I mean, they can grow up to three thousand. It was thought to be the oldest, uh, the oldest species for a while until they discovered the bristle cone. The bristle cone, obviously, is now uh, reckoned to be the oldest one. So, 
So if we uh, go, go, go back onto the path and cross over the path um, and to that area just by the memorial garden. And I want to stop at this stump. There's a stump tree there. There's another copper beech on the right hand side and to the left hand side of the stump. There's another lime tree. But the stump marks the spot where that bomb fell in World War II, blowing out the, uh, the north side of the church. Um, in actual fact, it was thought to be a parachute mine. They called them parachute mines because they tended to get dropped <coughs> at sea, and then they would just float around and hope to blow up uh, a ship up or something like that. But then they started to be used in land as well. And, uh, as I say, it was thought that the one landing in the uh, in the churchyard there was a parachute mine. And of course, as a result of blowing out the north side of the church, they left the Rosemary's, uh, Rosemary's handiwork. So, uh, walking then from that stump over towards the fence on the, the western side, we uh, come up to one of many hollies that are in the, uh, in the churchyard. This is a particularly large one, just worth uh, talking about. Um, it, I say it's a, a holly tree, but in fact it's a multi-stemmed holly tree. If you go, if you go out on walkabout, just have a look and see how many, uh, how many individual trunks are coming out. Possibly as a result of coppicing, you know, you, you cut something off at the base, lateral buds will tend to take over and, and start growing again. You don't normally coppice holly, uh, you know, it's usually a bit of a nuisance. Uh, I reckon somebody thought that's a bit of a nuisance. I'm going to cut that one down, <laughs> and you know, they cut their own back by throwing up lots of holly trees. So, uh, <laughs> but as I say, we've got common holly um, in the in the churchyard, and we've got quite a number of variegated hollies as well. And we all know about the symbolism of holly, uh, holly at, at, at Christmas time, um, and uh, it was. Uh, seen as a fertility symbol and it was um, uh, had sort of certain symbolism uh, relating to uh, being a charm against uh, witches and uh, goblins and Harry Potter's woman <laughs> was Holly Wood. He also had a phoenix feather in it as well but uh, um, you know whether it was Voldemort or Harry Potter you know he had similar ones and Harris was Holly, and uh, all the ones for you. And then a little bit further over from the Holly, against the uh, against this metal palisade fence here, we've got another of the cedars. This one is the Atlas cedar uh, or blue cedar. Uh, has a very uh, blue colour to to the leaf. Um, and uh, oh, sorry, I just. I want to just pop back to Holly for one minute. I've just missed you something about it. Um, it's Holly Trees and Prickers. And I mentioned Mars Essence earlier on about beech leaves standing on trees. Uh, we've got another essence. This one is called Spine Essence. Spine Essence. It's a theory which says that the leaves lower down on a holly tree produces prickles in response to browsing by animals. But the further up the tree you go, or the further up the bush you go, you don't get prickles uh, because they haven't been subject to, to nibbling. So, um, <coughs> spine essence theory. Yeah, I've said that three times now. That's it, <laughs> spine essence. So, uh, going back to uh, the Atlas cedar, ours is quite a young one still, as you can see. There's a really old one in, um, uh, in the White House in Washington. Jimmy Carter, when he was president, he, he built like a, a tree platform for his kids to, uh, to play in the, uh, in the Atlas Cedar in the, in the White House. <laughs> um, ash is, uh, is a particularly interesting timber, as we come on to the ash tree next. Um, that one's not far from the, uh, the blue cedar. Just turn around and start walking back in towards the, uh, the footpath and you have the ash. And we've, of course, been suffering a lot from ash dieback recently, and, um, but these are still surviving in the churchyard, so, you know, fingers crossed we'll be lucky with these. Um, the Scandinavians, I mean, they revere the ash, and uh, they, uh, 
Brexit will have lost over 90% of the ash trees in Scandinavia have gone due to, due to ash dieback. Um, uh, again, the Scandinavians had this uh, god, they called Yggdrasil, Yggdrasil and the, the ash tree, you know, that was supposed to go up into the heavens and its roots tended to go down into the depths of hell. So, uh, uh, in Norse mythology, uh, they, uh, they revered the, uh, the ash. Uh, and as I say, it's quite a strong timber. It's got a, um, it, it withstands shock and uh, so it tends to, uh, to get used for things where they are subject to, uh, to shock and uh, um, some of those include sort of oars and hockey sticks and skis, but we've got ash in the church. Trudy said I was a bell ringer. The bell stays, you know, when the bell is left up, it rests against a wooden stay, against the, the frame of the, the bell frame, and they're made of ash because they're really springy. So if you're learning to ring, you know, and you're, you pull it, and uh, when you're bell ringing, obviously you're just going up to the balance and then coming back down again. And if you go a little bit too much, the stay bounces on the, on the rest. But because it's ash normally, it will just bounce. Occasionally it doesn't bounce. And you know, you know, a new one, but uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very pliable and springy type of wood. So, uh, from that ash tree, back towards the, uh, back towards the footpath, and um, we come against up to the skeleton of our dawn redwood. I'm afraid our dawn redwood is no more. That's not actually quite true, because I went out the other day, just, you know, little places in the tree, they're struggling to put something out. Don't think it'll be enough to save it, I'm afraid, but uh, again, it's another living fossil, uh, thought to have been extinct for uh, over a couple of million years, um, and then in China, where else, uh, suddenly they discovered uh, uh, some trees in a very remote area, and uh, they then started sending some of that to Europe and uh, America, and we started growing it here. I mean, it's a lovely tree. If anybody is thinking of, you know, a memorial tree or something like that, couldn't choose better than a dawn redwood. I mean, in the bottom, they just turn this gorgeous color, and unlike a lot of fir trees, they lose their needles uh, in, in winter, and then pop them out again, as, uh, as I showed you there. Um, so, still a little bit of life in ours, but I think David, the tree officer, told me that it might have to go, because um, I don't think that'd be enough to leap back into life. So, we're back now on the path, uh, that's just off the path on, on this side, but look around and look towards Carolyn's house. There is this magnificent cedar, the Diodar cedar. Diodar, uh, Diodar, David, David Diodar, or something. It comes from Sanskrit anyway, and is, is the tree of the gods in, in Sanskrit. Uh, Himalayan cedar, and it's a gorgeous, really graceful tree. You know, the branches tend to sort of sweep down, uh, and uh, lovely tree. Um, and again, uh, used for boat building, and particularly up in the Himalayas, um, all the houseboats, uh, you know, passage to India and things like that, if you've seen it, you know, they go out on the houseboats and on, uh, on Lake Dal. Uh, so, um, uh, tend to be used for that, uh, that sort of thing. And when the, uh, the Brits were in India in the days of the British Raj, again, a very strong timber, it used to be used in building barracks and railway bridges and canal bridges and all sorts of things. Very ar aromatic, the, uh, uh, the deodar, and uh, the made for incense, using uh, incense, and the oils are extracted for aromatherapy. Uh, it's also a, a great insect repellent, actually. I mean, cedar, those of you, you know, I mean, you might used to use little round balls of meat, you know, um, for uh, moth killers, mm -hmm. really. but nowadays you buy little round balls of cedar wood and they do the same thing. <coughs> It's a national tree, actually, of uh, Pakistan. 
and tucked behind it, just up against Carolyn's fence, is one of four oak species we've got. This one's the holm oak, holly oak, and it's a, um, it keeps its leaves all the way through the winter, so it's in sort of leaf now. Um, if you go and have a look at that, it's not really a fascinating, uh, the wood uh, and the trunk is, is quite fascinating. Uh, very strong wood, and in fact, um, it was used by uh, Romans for chariot wheels, and again, used as a, uh, I suppose you'd call it almost the equivalent of the Victoria Cross, uh, as a, a garland or a crown for, um, for Corona Civica. Um, if somebody had saved lives in battle or something like that, they, they were uh, commemorated, they were awarded a, a, a Corona Civica, which was made of monument formerly. Uh, and then, not far from the whole mook, we walk up the path a little way, and it's a gorgeous still, it's an ornamental tree, it's a maple, it's a Paper bark maple, but it's it's really really gorgeous to uh, to see. Uh, like all maples, it turns a gorgeous colour in, in the autumn. Uh, as uh, it's in leaf, it's starting to come into leaf now. It starts off with like pale pale yellow, uh, then to to light green, and then as it goes through the season, it starts to colour up. So that's the uh, the paper bark maple. Uh, and I wasn't going to talk about this tree, but when I was up there the other day I thought, gosh, that's really gorgeous. And that is, um, there's a bird cherry just behind it. And if you go out now, it is in full blossom. And uh, we've got a number of bird cherries in the, uh, in the churchyard, but that one seems to be particularly gorgeous. <laughs> Actually, if you look carefully, I'm sure it was obviously planted at the time that the uh, particular grain was put in, but you, know, you can see the remains of the grain. I mean, the tree has just totally dominated there, but right now, gorgeous blossom, almond smell to the blossom. Uh, that's the bird cherry. It's called bird cherry because you can't eat, you know, we don't like them. They're, they've got high levels of tannin in the, in the cherries. Birds love them. Uh, they, they can be used for flavorings and that sort of thing, particularly flavoring sort of a, a, a liquor, you know, with rum and brandy. And they, they will use bird cherries to, uh, to flavor them. Uh, but I wanted then next to the um, uh, paper bark maple, it's the uh, uh, um, second of the four oak species we've got. This one's the turkey oak. Um, now, turkey oak, because it came from Turkey, it was hailed as the, a brilliant oak tree, or oak timber, uh, failed to live up to the expectation. It tended to split, and uh, when it was being seasoned, if you used it outside, it rotted. So, absolutely useless as an outside. Uh, timber, but still used for uh, panelling, and uh, it was called the wainscoting uh, oak. Um, so can be used inside, not really very much used to be used uh, outside. But it's got the uh, this gorgeous little mossy cups, you know, where the or mossy hats where the acorns uh, are formed, and a very distinctive leaf, uh, much larger than the English oak. Um, and that's the turkey oak. But just beyond the turkey oak is uh, one of a couple of species of English oak we've got, um, just by the, the water hut there. Um, and uh, obviously the English oak tends to be held in, uh, in a special place in, in our culture, in our, uh, in our history, in our hearts, I guess. And, um, uh, and it's probably tree that has the greatest wildlife potential. I mean, anything and everything will, will uh, use the oak tree. Even the fallen leaves are great for uh, um, maintaining sort of biodiversity of the leaf litter. Um, it was uh, celebrated by, uh, um, again, various uh, Zeus and uh, um, the Celts. Uh, you know, tended to honor the oak tree. Uh, um, the Druids particularly held it sacred. I mean, uh, the Druids uh, held again ceremonies under the oak, particularly the cutting of mistletoe 
on, on an open trip, you just you stop you know, in the special event for drillers. But from uh, the um, point of view of uh, use, if you like, um, we go back to the problem that we were talking about with the longbow stays and the fact that the, uh, we didn't have many left um, when uh, we were trying to find them from different parts of the world. The oak obviously was used in Tudor times in particular for, uh, and up until the 18th century certainly, and even, even longer for uh, a boat building. And um, I think there was a fact I found here that, uh, yeah, in Elizabeth the first time, laws were passed to protect the tree because so much had been felled for <coughs> shipbuilding. So they, uh, they had to undertake special planting programs to ensure the supply of oak uh, for the future. Uh, and um, in the New Forest, where there's quite a bit of oak, I mean, they still operate the, um, uh, the commoners in, uh, in the New Forest still have this what they call panage, where they uh, turn their pigs out in the autumn to uh, feed off the acorns. So we're nearly at the, the end of the um, uh, churchyard, but this is the last of the four boats, the pin oak, uh, produces a, uh, a leaf which has got like little spikes on, on it, and uh, again one that turns, uh, turns colour uh, in, in the autumn. And uh, a bit like beech, will tend to hang on to, uh, hang on to its leaves uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the winter. And, and it, but this one uh, is starting to shoot again now, so uh, there are still a few leaves left from, the, uh, uh, from last year uh, at the bottom of the tree, but um, it's coming into, uh, into leaf again now. So those are the four oaks, the uh, palm oak, uh, the turkey oak, the English oak, and the, uh, and the pin oak. Uh, and the last sort of tree I just wanted to touch on was the, um, the walnut uh, that we've got, that's where the, where the seat is, just by the hedge. Um, now, it's, you go back to the, uh, the Romans, the, as the uh, Roman army swept through Gaul and into, into Britain, the, uh, uh, they used to carry um, walnuts as uh, part of their food. Uh, they carried walnut oil for, for cooking and uh, I guess tended to scatter the remains around and therefore the oaks, that, uh, the walnuts that we've got uh, in, uh, in the UK tend to go back to, uh, to Roman times. The Romans called it the Royal Nut of Jove, uh, and they imported it originally from Greece anyway, so it wasn't an Italian, uh, Italian species, but it does go back you know, to Roman times, certainly to 100 BC. Um, but walnut timber is highly sought after. I mean, it, it polishes well, it's got a gorgeous grain, uh, so it tends to be used in sort of extensive furniture building and that sort of thing. But there is just one interesting thing to mention about this, and this, if you look at the, uh, this is the walnut, obviously, as the shucks are, are coming off the wall, the leaves of the walnut inside. You open up the walnut, and this is the shape that we're all familiar with. And I just wanted to comment on uh, the fact that it looks a bit like a brain, and Therefore, it led to something where they reckoned that walnut would be able to cure brain disorders. And that goes back to something called the doctrine of signatures. And we're talking now uh, probably about the 15th century. So the doctrine of signatures stated that preparations made by plants that look like parts of the human body could be used to treat ailments from those particular parts. Uh, and it was felt that it was God that had um, made a sign or a signature to say all plants are there for man to, be, to, man to use. It's up to man to work out how to use them. Uh, but we do have, even today, some, uh, um, some species that might, those, certainly those of you who are gardeners and things, and I know we've got some in here, but we'll, we'll probably recognize this. We've got eyebright, which was used for eye infections, or a banshee. 
There's something called edge wound work, which is a statis, uh, an antiseptic for this. There's liver works, or hepatica, used for liver. Uh, there's something called a pulmonaria, it's also called a lung work, and that was used for pulmonary diseases. There's a spleen work, and a tooth work. <laughs> and so you've got all these names that still carry on from this idea that these plants could be used to treat. Uh, and for what reason? I mean, in the case of um, something called uh, birthwort, which uh, is a vine, a type vine, uh, that's when things tend to go wrong. It looked like a uterus, it was therefore used in pregnancy and that sort of thing. Problem was, uh, it was also carcinogenic, so uh, uh, not particularly helpful. And in fact, this was regarded you know, now as a bit of a pseudoscience, if you like. But it's just interesting that it all started with the walnut looking like the brain and uh, the doctrine of signatures. Okay, so that just about ends our little tour around the churchyard. <coughs> Perhaps we just ought to mention the, uh, the new trees that, that, that we've been planting over the last few years. Members of the congregation, the scouts, Beavers and cubs have been up here planting trees, and we've lost some, but we've replanted some, and they're all starting now to, to look uh, not bad at all. And they were all planted really uh, as a part of the Queen's uh, Jubilee green canopy. And if we are going to go out into the churchyard afterwards, we've got a little plaque now that we put up on the uh, on the water uh, uh, hut to commemorate the fact that. 500 or so trees were planted uh, here uh, in, the, uh, in the churchyard uh, for the Queen's Jubilee. So, that's about it. Um, maybe just to say, my wife loves poetry, so she <coughs> gave me this to uh, finish. Trees, I'm the heat of your heart on cold winter nights, the friendly shade screening you from the summer sun. My fruits make refreshing draughts, quenching your thirst as you journey on. I am the beam that holds your house, the board of your table, the bed on which you lie, and the timber that builds your boat. I am the handle of your hoe, the door of your homestead, the wood of your cradle, and the shell of your coffin. I am the bread of kindness, and the flower of beauty. Ye who pass by, listen to my prayer. Harm me not. Thank you. Memorials. We are hoping eventually to set up a 
uh, a memorial book in the church so people can come and remember. But the whole idea that it is open and it is natural, and that's what we've like for, for our faculty, and that's what we've got. Um, there is going to be a signpost put there uh, so people know it's consecrated, but um, I'm just aware that uh, a few people have been asking me about what's going to happen to that area. It's going to remain a very natural and open area without any kind of designation or memorial plaques or stones there. Uh, I just, when I saw that picture, I thought it would just give me an opportunity to speak to a, a large number of people, both from the church and the parish, um, and, and explain to you what that area is for. Anyway, that's me done. I found this fascinating, although I did spend some time uh, out in the churchyard looking at the trees with the children. <laughs> it was lovely. Having said that this was a, a tool that kids could find interesting, it was lovely that they came along and um, welcomed them. Anyway, so before we adjourn to outside and do those that want to to follow Roger and have a look around the churchyard, I'm going to ask Carolyn just to make a vote of thanks <laughs> to Roger on our behalf. <laughs> Roger, thank you very much. We really appreciate your very knowledge much, and your expertise and for giving us this talk. Thanks very much. That's yeah. it. And what a lovely day you had for me. Well, as I say, at one stage I thought, I know how to talk to them inside. Let's do it all that time. And then I thought, maybe not. Before we adjourn, then, there's somebody else who might be going to ask Carolyn to make a presentation to. Um, David Marcus, I'm sure you're going to cringe now and get very embarrassed and hide. Um, but David took, uh, was already running the uh, Churchyard Working Party, which meets on a Tuesday, and I, I can see some familiar faces, people who come up on a Tuesday and help. It's a lovely, friendly group. And David, I think you've been doing that ever since I arrived 12 years ago. So you've been involved with that for a very long time. And a couple of years ago, um, after quite a long space of not having a tree officer, a designated tree officer, um, David took on that role. It did take a little while to get things kind of sorted out. We probably spend between uh, five and twelve thousand pounds a year on maintaining the trees and keeping them healthy. Um, and it's a big job because it's a conservation area, we have to speak to the diocese. Um, about our trees as well as the city council and David has taken this on uh, uh, with great enthusiasm and uh, and it's a very good job and we really do appreciate all you do for us and so much to your embarrassment I'm sure I'm going to thank you <laughs> I'd like to thank um, Trudy and Ros and Ian for all the work they do in, in enabling these talks to take place um, and to Karen and her team for the refreshments which I'm sure you'll enjoy and are going to be with your cakes, thank you very much. So enjoy the rest of the afternoon, enjoy the sunshine and the trees and enjoy the refreshments. Can I just... <laughs> Can I just flag up to you that there is a coach tour done next Friday looking round Essex, some of the churches of Essex where Rosemary Rutherford's stained glass windows are, and there are still seats available, a few seats available. There's a poster up there about it, so if anyone is interested in that, it's one of the Ray Stella coach tours, so it leads from the Angel next Friday. And the next talk we're going to have will be on Saturday the 24th of June, we're well, looking at the churchyard natural history of plants, fungi, and lichens. That will be led by Sue Browning, who's very familiar to many of you. Before then, on the 3rd of June, Ian and Ros are going to do a tour of the church walls. This was requested when Ian did his talk in February, really interesting, but it wasn't suitable to go outside and look at the church, and he promised that he would do a tour in the better weather. So we're praying for good weather on the 3rd, Saturday, 3rd of June. Anybody that wants to join, going round looking at the church halls. So thank you very much for your attention today. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful afternoon. Um, please explore the churchyard, view the exhibition. Although we've had bees, there have been 
clear now. So there's only going to be the odd come, I think, in the church at the moment. The exhibition is open there, the Rutherford exhibition. Um, or enjoy socialising as a cup of tea or coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you.